more love, more joy, everything. It's inspired young people. Inspiration comes from within you. When you clear out the garbage that's in your mind, you then create space for something better, more beautiful to come in. Let's have life and have it more abundantly. I say yes. It's like taking a workshop. I get to be in my pajamas. We have a very active imagination, which is why it's important to learn how to harness it and then point it in the direction you want to go. I listen to your show every day. It's time now for Living Your Inspired Life with Susan Burrell. Susan is no-nonsense, inspirational, motivational, and fun. This is positive talk radio. Practical wisdom for everyday life. It's a gift you give yourself. Now, here's Susan. And welcome to Living Your Inspired Life. You're listening to listening to News Talk 1590 KVTA. And I just want to remind everybody at the beginning of the show, if you are just tuning in, we have a website. It's a great website. It's called livingyourinspiredlife.org. I I invite you to go there and tune in and tune up and see the kind of work we've been doing. We get to do phenomenal work there every week. Every show that's recorded uh, and airs on KVTA is archived on the website along with some inspirational kind of uh, homework, if you will. And uh, I just invite you to do that. Go to livingyourinspiredlife.org and check it out. So today, because the 4th of July is happening, I (laughs) serendipitously, that's a word, serendipitously, uh, met this man and saw his work and went, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So I want to welcome onto the show Joe Soames. Did I say it right? Soam, singular. Soam. There's only one Soam. of me today. Oh, thank God. Thank God. What would I be doing if there was more multiples? So Joe is a photographer and he has an amazing book. I invite everybody to get a copy. It's called Visions of America. And Joe, you have been a photographing Photo- photographing, I make up words. You've been a photographer for over 30 years documenting democracy in America, and that's what the book is all about. I saw pictures, I saw the book, I was drooling. In fact, I'm getting a copy. So I want to I want to ask you why, I mean, how did that begin, this idea of shooting photo- photography that's all about democracy? It, it began really... In two respects. One, my uh, childhood growing up in the Midwest, which is about as American as you get, and more specifically growing up on off of uh, Route 66, ah. and also having my high school chosen as the most typical high school class in the United States. Oh, my goodness. And also buying my first house in my early 20s and learning later that it was the the population center of the United States. So I had this kind of sense of being, and also on the banks of the Mississippi River. So I kind of felt like I was, you know, g- generically American, so to say. Right. And, and it went on as I uh, followed uh, my studies at the University of Missouri, uh, then to become an American history teacher, of course, and and that's when I fell in, you know, in love, so to say, with the founder, the founding generation of America, as well as Native Americans later. But um, uh, in the classroom, I really fell in love with America. Although I ultimately um, didn't do as well in the classroom because I realized I was more of a referee and a truant officer, right. keeping track of kids and spit wad wars and all kinds of things. And so ultimately, I decided to translate my love affair for the United States and the founding vision of America into a, a career that I would never get bored with, I could never complete. And it would always keep me busy and uh, trying t- to capture democracy in America. Because, And why democracy? If you have to rip it all apart, the United States, it's more than neon signs saying Route 66 or Norman Rockwell's paintings. It's basically that there was and is a central idea mm-hmm. that is the backbone of what makes all 325 million of us uniquely American. And that 
unique uh, contribution to the world is probably America's adaptation of, of what the Greeks and what the Romans started, democracy. And so when – this is a long answer. No, I but, love it because I, I think this is important for people to remember – really where the root of democracy and this country was founded because with every all the mishigash that's going on in the world right now and all the mishigash going on around our politics it's important for people to really remember the truth of who we are as Americans and what we how we were founded and what we stand on not necessarily how it's evolved um, yeah. So I want your long answer, Joe. Well, d- democracy is the central thread that is the self-organizing principle of American civilization. And if that's the premise, then how would you interpret that photographically? So we go from – if we view democracy as a painter would, maybe Van Gogh or Monet or, or, or any painter um, – as negative space, negative space, most artists will know is the space around something. Mm-hmm. But it, you can't describe negative space any more than you can describe air. Thus, you really can't describe, you can talk about the process of democracy, of voting and speaking out and tweeting and many different ways of expressing democracy or protesting. But how do you photograph it? So it it was a bit of a conundrum, and it gave me the artistic license to interpret it my way uh, and to, over decades, just kind of pick apart the what it's around. Thus, the small towns of America are quintessentially American, or the icons defined what democracy is symbolically. Yeah. Or the cities that grew out of the ground, like Chicago, which invented the skyline. Uh, These are all unique American phenomena that changed the world as much as it changed this country. And it's all the soil. The soil of it all is democracy. Is democracy. So that's, that's how the book is organized, is on this question. How does one photograph democracy? And you could have 10,000 photographers give them the same question, and you'd have 10,000 different portraits. My portrait came out the way it did, and it's still emerging because I try to keep it current by doing events from Memorial Day most recently to where my wife and I are going on July 4th, which is Telluride, Colorado, to photograph that. So it's something that never stops and it is an ongoing story, and I want to be part of that story and then share that story with others so they're reminded of this incredible inheritance that we've all been recipients of. So in the, so you, were, you have been for, photographed, uh, photographer, why can't I say that photographer, word Photographer, I'll say it for Holy you, photographer. My. You've been doing this, photographing America for th- over 30 years now. So so in your work, there is an evolutionary look of, of our country as well, or a historical look. In well, it, yeah? the, the way to say it, um, yeah, uh, some of my pictures, they go, well, you're, some of your women shots, you know, they have big hair. And I say, of course they do, because I've been photographing, you know, the United States. So, so consequently... It's not a frozen portrait. I love it's an that. emerging pro- portrait, and you can see it. You can see these things in hairstyles and plaid shirts and things like that. So specifically, I kind of really got into it in the '80s. So my work goes from the '80s to 2014. No, no wonder the big hair. Yeah, there's <laughs> bi- there was big hair then. <laughs> yeah, I remember it well. The big hair. I had some myself. So. Um, your images are everybody's seen your images i would imagine by now and we don't even know we've seen it because it's backdrops and background for a multitude of uh shows and like on the view right well yeah my my friend in washington dc at the wilson center um has a tv show and when he interviewed me he said oh you're kind of like uh a studio musician where you really don't know their name, but they're on every song that you always loved. 
And my images are now numerically have been published over 500,000 times in my lifetime. Oh, my goodness. And, and approximately 50,000 times a year. And since we started this interview, I've published once, sometimes, around someplace around the world. And so, What a way to live a life, man. Well, it was, uh, it was economically um, uh, and pragmatically, you know, and that's one of the things the founders were. They were practical dreamers. And oh, I like the way you said that. Yes. Or pragmatic, as Henry James would, you know, say later in the concept of pragmatism. But I'm a practical dreamer in respect that I um, have never really ever truly worked uh, a job where I had a boss telling me what to do. I mean, I already, I'm kind of my own boss and I'm quite the tyrant to myself as it is. So, uh, so consequently, this has given me a certain amount of freedom, which uh, is illustrative of, of, again, the founder's concept right. of, of democracy. freedom, democracy, and, and liberty. So it's given me um, a ticket, uh, so to say, uh, to you know, throw my cameras in the back seat and just drive down any road. And long, I started this long before GPS and cell phones, um, and not even using paper maps all the time, because it kind of took me back to my childhood when I was 12, 13, growing up off of Route 66. My my friends and I would take these bicycle rides, and at 9 a.m., our sole destination was getting lost. Oh, wow. And, yep. and those we were did the a days where you could. Yeah, we did a pretty good job of getting lost, but we all, always found our way home when it was dinner time at six o'clock. So, <laughs> so consequently, then the next day would be a new opportunity to get lost. So, you know, I'm one of the people that say that I actually have made a, a, a profession of, of getting lost. And getting lost... S- I have found myself. Oh, uh, I love it. So, and frequently it ends up in dead end roads, and sometimes um, actually dogs chasing me out, or the worst, uh, my biggest photo enemy are security guards that, you know, have big guns. And uh, like in New York recently, where they say, you cannot stand here. You have to stay here and wait for three hours for another cop to check you out. Wow. To take these pictures. So, a lot of photography is really overcoming obstacles mm. and, and that practical part that I was inferring to is that how do you make a buck out of it? And that's why publishing images in what's referred to as stock photography is very few of my photos are taken on assignment. That was the way it used to be done. Right. And that still happens if you're Annie Leibovitz and Queen Elizabeth needs her photograph. But all of my pictures were taken, quote, on spec, not knowing if they would ever be used or if they were any good. So when I take photos, I never have any idea whether they're any good or, or not. And thus, then I, you know, I call out, I take as much joy in deleting pictures as I do in taking pictures, because a great photographer is not known for what they take, but what they delete, because then the cream mm-hmm. raise, rises. Right. So those pictures then are given to my photo agents, and those photo agents ultimately uh, find buyers for them at Getty Images or at Corbis Images or Alamy or Shutterstock. I'm with all those. Uh-huh. So uh, so as you were speaking, Joe, I was hearing um, freedom and and freedom of choice. And that's a that's a principle that we talk about often on living your inspired life, that we're always at choice, no matter what the circumstance looks like. We are always at choice to choose whichever road we want to travel down and we can change our mind. Yeah, and I read in your in uh, in your book where uh, so, somebody said you. They thought you do more U-turns in your life than anybody else. And that's the truth, right? <laughs> we, and that's part of what democracy is, is we, are, we have freedom of choice all the time. Yeah, and every minute, you know, we can, there are decisions we need to make. And when you take the um, assignment, as I did, 
the self-assignment to photograph mm-hmm. democracy in America, that how does one do that artistically or just in living every day? So when you get up at nine o'clock, you can decide to read the paper for three hours, or you can decide to get motivated and take action that propels you along towards what your goals are. Well, I, so I'm sorry, but one of the other things you said when you were describing how you made it your living, so to speak, how you make, uh, earn, earn money by doing it. Um, the thing that I also love that you said was that it wasn't, you weren't setting out, and this is, this trips people up a lot, setting out to make a buck by taking pictures. You were setting out to follow your heart and your inner commitment to document what you saw through your viewfinder. And and the idea of making money was not the reason you were getting up at dawn to take pictures. It was all about following your inner guidance system, your inner GPS. That's what I was hearing. And and I think a lot of people, when they go, well, sure, I want to write a novel, but how do I make money? Or yes, I want to be a model, but how do I make money? And that's when we all... Those are all barriers. Yeah, we all trip ourselves up. They're all psychological barriers. And um, the uh, uh, being Mm -hmm. self-propelled, you know... Possibly there was uh, some naivety to thinking. I didn't really, I mean, what you said is exactly right. Um, uh, You know, and there are cliches about following your passion. Bliss, your dreams. Yeah, and, and and the money will come. Yeah. And in this case, it did, you know, for me. And I can't say that, you know, that works for everybody else because, I mean, ultimately, uh, but I think, you know, if you have a brain and you have a plan and it doesn't ha- nothing good happens overnight you know my uh the first time i was published i mean i just it was a major high and when i found out that they were going to publish a picture i took 3 years ago uh-huh. i thought that was amazing yeah. you know and then all of a sudden i heard that there was this agency in New York called the Image Bank, which uh, more or less pioneered the field of stock photography. And I just always gravitated straight to the top. So I went to New York and I met the owner of of the agency. And and at that time, he's no longer with us, but his name was Larry Freed. And the Image Bank became the most dominant photo agency in the world. And it's still alive today. Technically, it's owned by uh, Getty Images. But when they represented my images, uh, suddenly I started seeing sales reports saying Israel, you know, oh, that it oh. sold in Israel. Oh. And then an image sold in Argentina. And then one was in London. You know, and then years later, you know, I'm talking about the practicality of turning my dream of democracy uh, into photographing that into a business. But later, there was another photographer in Washington, D.C. He was one, like one of many photographers that are that are military photographers. You know, they're in like uh, the, the Korean War or in this case, oh, mm-hmm. uh, Vietnam, mm-hmm. you know, and they get incredible access. Uh, and then when they come out of the military, they end up having all these technical skills and then they turn themselves into pro photographers. So this guy's name is, and, and you can see him online, it's uh, Jim Pickerel. I mean, it always sounded like picture, Pickerel. And Jim was kind of an inspiration to me. And, you know, we all need inspirations yeah. and and that you, you know, and I know to- Tony Robbins is big on this. You find out who is a model of And you find out specific uh, uh, actions that they took to become the person that you want to be. So Jim Pickerel was doing it for me. There was a picture of him standing in front of a light board, which is with hundreds and thousands of uh, slides, 35 millimeter slides, which was the primary medium. And I saw him dividing his slides like 11 identical shots. Huh that he would shoot everything 11 times. Hmm. So if it was in New York City or the Statue of Liberty or, or, or uh, the Eiffel Tower, whatever it was, there would be 11 identical shots. Now, you can't do that as well with people because you get 11 different expressions. Although when I did it, I, w- I would keep the best expression for myself 
And then progressively, the best would get go to New York, the second best would go to Los Angeles, the third best would go to London, then Paris, then, you know, Johannesburg. And pretty soon, I started modeling what Jim did, and my images were all over the world. So the way I translated this into a business, I just had, you know, I would go out and shoot for three months, four months, have tens of thousands of slides, throw all the trash away, then divide them up into 11 stacks, then go to the post office and send them to Tokyo, to, you know, now Beijing uh, and Thailand, whatever. And it's a lot easier now because it's all digital. Digital, yeah. But uh, then I was actually sending something physical. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about photography was when the internet came, I was a very quick adapter because I scanned all of those slides. Oh, my goodness. Because I realized that they would become a form of digital currency. And that currency is like a euro. You know, it's like a euro dollar and that it's easy now. And the reason they did the euro is because you could cross countries' borders Mm -hmm. and you'd have a different currency that would be universally accepted. That's what a scanned digital image is. Mm -hmm. And once that image is scanned then it can be given around the world or what I'll be doing in the next couple days, loading up my entire library to Amazon's cloud so that all of the images will exist in cyberspace and then different people can download them that way. Okay. So, But it all started with a physical mm-hmm. uh, commodity, which was 35 millimeter slides. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Uh- I really appreciate you explaining all that too, because there's a. I know that there's going to be uh, listeners out there that want to uh, emulate a bit of what you do. My son's a photographer. I keep encouraging him, but he doesn't know what to do with it. So uh, you know that kind of a thing where people just don't know. So I appreciate the sharing of your wisdom and experience. So let's go back to Visions of America, and the you not only. All right, I'm going to read a quote from your book, if you, if you will allow me. My visions of America is not just the manifestation of my boyhood dream to photo- photograph the U.S. It is living testimony of how the American idea has manifested over two centuries. Each picture in this book reflects what we have collectively achieved as an American civilization. And so the book itself... Uh, chronicles, like you said earlier, the icons, the founding fathers and, and their paths, but also uh, the, the indigenous, the Native Americans, and, and, and then the African Americans. And you actually went to Africa to fill that out, if you will, to really. So I, I would love if you could share some of, of that experience, because I, I think that that's profound. I guess as a photographer, because you're constantly looking for that perspective, right? It, it must have been something to help you see the other perspective. Well, I, I sought to make my vision inclusive because I grew up as a white guy in the Midwest. You know, I never met a Jewish person until I was 20 years old. Yeah. I never heard a foreign language spoken until I moved to California. <laughs> um, and... and I consciously tried to um, make my vision of America so that it would be inclusive uh, of others. And... um, Which I love, and I'm I'm deeply grateful for that. Yeah, so consequently, when you say founding fathers, if you want to have a baby of which we all are, the the new American, uh, you need a mother. Mm -hmm. And... My belief is that the Native Americans and the bringing together of Native American culture yes. and the European culture, uh-huh. as it came together, not only did it of affect uh, the geography of the United States, but also the foods we eat and uh, the populating of corn around the world and and uh, even now, the the way the national parks are addressing the wildfires, which we mm-hmm. all know too long because for the last hundred years, 
the national parks viewed wildfire fires as it, you need to suppress them. Right. And over that hundred years, it allowed the the forest to grow so big that it is now frequently when you have droughts like now, right. they are a threat. And so consequently, now there's ample evidence that the Native Americans actually did conscious burns to maintain the forest themselves. So so often, I mean, European culture, you know, from uh, smallpox to everything else, we just kind of rolled over that. But they're still with us, as is their spirit still with us, and as is everything that they achieved in their civilization long before, you know, Euro man got here. Right. So I, I so it's interesting that you brought up that uh, the the Europeans and how we did roll over everything, how we did, how they did, because we're we. Well, we, we're the we. I mean, I guess because I'm white, I represent a European, but and my that's my culture. But I, I kind of I also tend to think of that as the the way people were in the past. But anyway, this weekend I just saw a, a short video. Uh, about Yellowstone National Park and how they have, uh, I don't know how many years ago, brought wolves back to the park. And what they're finding is the ecosystem uh, of the park has shifted dramatically because the wolves are hunting the deer who were eating everything and causing a a low growth and the tree deforesting the trees. And and so then the bugs and the, and the butterflies and the birds weren't coming. And and now with the wolves being reintroduced again, uh, it's changing that entire ecosystem back to a a sustainable thing of, of, of where it was at the beginning. And, you know, the Europeans, uh, you know, settling the land and ranchers you know didn't want wolves we need the wolves gone we need the bears gone we need whoever's threatening my uh, my little, space my my little piece of americana yes and the the native american perspective that you bring in your book i think is awesome because it not only honors it and recognizes it but it also seems to point to this is where we're coming back to I well, think, and there's I hope. yes, and and you're talking about really balance, uh, sustainability, uh, yes. and all of that. And but but uh, there's a great uh, story that I stumbled into, and I'm standing next to a photographers from the New York Times, the Washington Post, the London Times, I managed to get when Queen Elizabeth and uh-huh. uh, and um, uh, came to the United States. In 1607, oh, I mean uh, 2007, <laughs> to to celebrate to celebrate uh-huh. the 400th anniversary of the English coming to Jamestown. Mm. At a certain point, you know, there was a press stand. I had to go there because, uh, and I had British uh, press passes, which got me further, got me to the White House easier than American press passes. Interesting, yeah. And so I followed it, you know, all the way because she was doing, that's the year she went to the Kentucky Derby, then she went to the White House. So she did this whole tour. But there she was in Jamestown, you know, on exactly the 400th anniversary of the English coming to America. And earlier that day, I had photographed the three ships uh, oh. that brought the English. Yeah. And I overheard people on radios saying it was 400 years to the minute that they know. Oh, goodness. Of, I got chills. And Tom, I, was I, the, got chills. I was the only one that had called ahead uh, with the, the, the Coast Guard to get permission to get on a boat because they were concerned about terrorist attacks of these English ship replicas. So, And then there was a mist that covered up all the houses on Jamestown. So it looked like the real thing. So... Uh, oh my gosh! Six hours later, there I was standing on this press stand, waiting two hours in about ninety-five degree heat for Queen Elizabeth, and there she was, a direct descendant of King James the Second, shaking hands with a direct descendant of Pocahontas. Oh, shaking hands uh, with Governor Wilder, former Governor Wilder, whose grandparents were slaves. Oh, interesting. So. The chapter in the book opens with the sentence, before we were red, white, and blue, we began as red, white, 
and black. Mm -hmm. And that spot. I got chills with you saying that. And that spot where that converged was within 12 years, the Native Americans, the Europeans, and the Africans all came to Jamestown. And when I went to the museum later, I didn't realize the first Africans ever to come to North America was approximately in 1619. Uh And they were brought to the same spot at Jamestown. So this is where they all, three major civilizations collided. And there's a quote in there, and I'll paraphrase it, uh, that Queen Elizabeth said, it's in the book, Uh, And what Queen Elizabeth said, she actually was here for the 350th anniversary because she's been on the throne for so long. Uh And she said, you know, just to paraphrase, when I came 50 years earlier to America, I thought that what we were celebrating was the spread of the English language Mm. across the planet. Mm. But she said, now, 50 years later, we know much more. And then it was this, she may not have used the word collision, but convergence. Convergence, yeah. Of the Africans, the Native Americans, and the Europeans that not only changed your country, but it changed much of the world. Yeah. And as I took these pictures, standing next to the Washington Post and the New York Times, I had chills going yeah, up and I down my body. Sharing this, yeah. Because it was like watching DNA exchange between people separated by four centuries. Wow, Joe. Joe Soames. I Okay, so we're talking about his book, Vision of America. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to Living Your Inspired Life, and we'll be right back to talk more about democracy and the face of America. Susan Burrell from Living Your Inspired Life. I always find it easier and more fun to expand my life by being connected to open-hearted, like-minded people committed to being on the same path I am. If you feel the same way, I suggest you visit a Center for Spiritual Living. There are wonderful communities in Ventura, Ojai, Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Pleasant Valley, Camarillo, and Westlake Village. You'll find terrific people, great information, and more tools to help you live the life you were born to live. So go to CSL.org to find a center near you. That's CSL.org for a center near you. Welcome back to Living Your Inspired Life. I'm Susan Burrell, and the music that we got to listen to, just the brief little snippet, is by Roger Kellaway, who wrote music for Joe Soam, The Vision of America, his photography, and this music is specific to your photography, right, Joe? Yes, and it was uh, even further. Roger is a renowned jazz pianist oh, yeah, that lives in it. Ojai and has lived in New York uh, for many years, but... Um, He's also uh, an amazing composer. He did All in the Family, the theme song uh, oh, for the TV right. show. You know, he played with everybody from Joni Mitchell to Yo-Yo Ma to uh, j- just co- countless people. Most recently was music director for Tony Bennett. Okay. Uh, so anyway, he composed based upon the theme of How Do You Photograph Democracy and the chapters of the book, a photo symphony called Visions of America. And he said, I think we need songs, so could I suggest some songwriters? And I said, absolutely. I used to be a musician as well. And he said, uh, well, I said, who'd you have in mind? And he said, well, I'm I'm friends with uh, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, you know, which are kind of like living American song legends. Right. The way we were and... Yeah, 65 songs for Barbra Streisand and... Uh, countless other uh, others, Oscars, Grammys, you know. So, so, so they wrote six, five songs, 
And then the singers were initially Patty Austin, later Judith Hill. Oh. Also Stephen Tyrell, who produced all of Dionne Warwick's hits mm-hmm. and Rod Stewart. And the narrator uh, doing My Journey to Photograph America uh, was uh, Roger's also friend, Clint Eastwood. Oh, my goodness. So, what, that's a stellar cast to showcase your work. Well, it was, uh, uh, it was a thrill. And uh, Clint narrated my, quote, little script. And uh, so now I have Clint uh, acting out my journey to photograph democracy. <laughs> and we performed this uh, 16 total times, eight times in Boston with the Boston Pops. Oh, wow. Five times uh, with Peter Nero and the Philly Pops. And most recent in Ventura County and in Los Angeles at Oxnard, the Performing Arts Center, Thousand Oaks, the Civic Arts Center, and then also in Santa Monica with the New West Symphony Orchestra. Lovely. And uh, Marcel Leninger was the conductor for that. And uh, we're pleased to say that they were the highest attendance in the 18-year history of the New West Symphony and also the largest box office. Oh, my goodness. So it was... Wow. And 100 people were on stage. It was a 25-piece choir, 65-piece orchestra, and then Roger, what you were listening to on piano. Okay, I want to go to the next performance, wherever it is. I I just want to go because I I know it would be... uh, full of chills and thrills. So tell everybody how they can order your book or get a copy. Well, if you're interested, uh, Reader's Digest just came out with a 2012 edition. So the images were updated. There's a whole chapter on presidents. And I have photographed both parties, um, including third parties, Ralph Nader and Ross Perot. Oh, goodness. And, yeah. and there's more than a thousand photographs in this book. You know, and it's the... Uh, uh, the best of the best, so to say. And in the president section, it goes from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama. But whenever one president is running, I have his opponent. In this case, the last images added were Mitt Romney Mm -hmm. and Michelle Obama. So I added them. I even put the Tea Party in. I've got things from the far left to the far right, because the book is really not about politics, but politics are also about democracy right. and us choosing our winners. So that's why, uh, as to who will lead the country. Again, so, it goes back to freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. And we collectively make that choice every two years and every four years mm-hmm. uh, for our, our national leaders. So this book uh, can now be exclusively bought uh, through me, and I will inscribe it. All you have to do is send me an email with who you would want it inscribed to. It's a great gift for either July 4th or Christmas or any day of the year. An anniversary. I'm getting it from my parents' anniversary. Yes, our, our holidays. But it's joseph at visionsofamerica.com. And I'll say that for your uh, yeah. listeners one more time. Joseph at visionsofamerica.com. And if you forget that... Then you can just go to the website, visionsofamerica.com, and possibly your website will put yeah, like we, a, yes. a direction. But if you send me an email, all you have to do is send a, send a check for the book, and I'll inscribe the book exactly the way you like it. Lovely, lovely. So we're, we've been talking about the, the ride of democracy and the development of democracy, if you will. And one of the things that we were talking about before we went to break was this convergence of uh, – of the Native American, the European, and the black culture, the African culture, that happened before we even became a country, before 1776. And uh, so it's interesting to to me uh, uh, to look at it from a historical perspective how when uh, the Declaration of Independence was written and the Constitution, there's still there was still kind of this un, um, unconscious factor, if you will. That's how I choose to look at it. Of all men are created equal, and you, yet you know, there's a fascinating book that a, a friend recently gave me that I'm reading right now, and um, the author's name, unfortunately, I don't remember, but the book's title is called American Nations, mm. and the the premise is that when we say English or European, it sounds like it's one group. Right. And the reality is the United States, his premise is 
that the United States and Canada and Mexico, he views it as North America, and that there really aren't the 13 uh, provinces in Canada and 50 in the United States and 30-something in Mexico. But there really are 11 basic nations in North America that define who we are and and that 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 these borders that we have for separating Missouri from Kansas and North Dakota from South Dakota are somewhat obviously arbitrary borders mm, yes but that there are uh, uh, more profound borders because the groups that came here so when we talk about an American belief system, it's really systems because we had Scottish coming, we had Irish coming, we had the Germans, the and Italians. The, uh, Italians and English, uh, uh, then ultimately Asians. So his premise is that there are these 11 nations and like uh, he has different names for them in the Deep South which is a aristocratic planters. And these are the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. They were a planter society. Mm -hmm. Who do you think Thomas Jefferson was? He was a great landowner. Who do you think George Washington was? Who do you think James Madison was? James Monroe. These people were all from this part of England that were uh, high aristocrats, but they believed in a concept of of democracy, but it was more intellectual. That's how they could juxtapose while we believe that all men are created free except for our slaves. Um, and our women. And, sorry, and, and our women and Native that. Americans. But but they also created their brilliance was that they that it was a self correcting system. That over time, just as we watched more recently, uh, even w when Prop 8 was overturned oh, most boy. recently in, the, in the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, is that if a wrong is made, like we systematically oppress the Japanese during World War II that were living in California that had nothing to do with the Japanese that were attacking us at Pearl Harbor, that we will over time correct that. And with slavery, it took a lot more time. I mean, honestly, uh, uh, the, w our nation has spent more years in a state of slavery than a state of freedom. It's, Isn't that interesting? I mean, That's we we had slavery for longer than yeah. we had freedom. Yeah, and and, and we're we had still to just do getting used to it. And we're still getting used to it. We're still trying to enforce voters' rights, which should be long done. But these things take a long time, and so these eleven nations of America have been in a form of creative evolution and collision, and that the American. Uh, mind, so to say, is really the American minds. And we are less defined by our race or our geography. What does define us is this ideal and this idea of democracy, freedom, and liberty. And thus, then, through public debates and elections and protest. We speak out and we ultimately unravel what is this universal belief that we have. But our ideals are something just like my book will never be achieved because whatever we were on Tuesday will be different than we are on Thursday. So thus, it's really about the journey. It's just like our personal life. It's really a process, and it's a never-ending process. That's why when I chose this subject as a photographer, it I wanted to do something, I think I heard Ted Turner say this in an interview, choose something that's bigger than you, that you can never complete, it's never-ending, and you'll always feel renewed when you come back to it, that it's never over. Because when it's over, You'll end up in an old folks' home, right? You know, yep. and and uh, watching TV. All those people that think, oh, retirement is going to be the the good thing, you know, that's can't wait until I can retire. Can't wait until I have a vacation. Can't. But what what you're just 
I agree with you because what you, what really is happening is they they can't wait. They they are not living their lives now. They're thinking that oh I'll, I'll get to that when I get to go on vacation or I'll get to do that when I'm retired. But that's not always the truth. Yes, and I so thus you know and and I'm not the only one to do it. But for me, you know, and I can only speak about me because I that's my only you, personal Joe, reference. Yeah. But it but it's I made a commitment to something that I felt would always hold my interest. I could never achieve, and most importantly, the only advice I do have is I do know many, many creative, talented people, and if I ever see a flaw in their thinking is that sometimes they're too quick to shift projects or themes Ah. and change careers because the things that I've accomplished I can now see that the only way that I was able to do this was over time. Right. Uh, And if you keep changing your project or changing your theme or changing your expression, you know, you can do it a couple times, but it may take you seven to 10 years to really give that good root. Right. I mean, it's taken me decades. Yeah. You know, I I mean, everybody else, maybe people can explode onto the music scene or something like that. But but they are the exception. You know, that's interesting because I I see that in the um, in the spiritual questing world, you know, where somebody, oh, you know, I tried Buddhism. It didn't work for me. Really? How long were you doing? How long were you doing? Oh, six months. But it didn't really resonate. It didn't stick. Uh, Hello. Did you sit for you know, you ha- or say, you know, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, I was Jewish for a while, and you know, I converted to Catholic after that. I mean, literally, it's like it's like they just are going and doing the hors d'oeuvre table, going, oh, well, that you know, that instead of the what well, you're talking about is perseverance, perseverance, and tenacity, and stick to itness. Yes, which also defines the American people. Yeah, very much so. We we are a, a culture of. I mean, the the only way the railroads got across. The country was well. Also, yeah, there was some. There was money, and there was a whole bunch of other stuff and slavery going but, on. But and there but was a was, major commitment by Abraham was, Lincoln to do that. And he said, "I can um, uh, chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. I can fight a civil war and defeat those uh, uh, Confederates uh, at the same time while I unite the nation with a railroad." And you know, people forget that railroad thing. You know, but the the bringing that was huge. it was huge. It was huge. And once the the war was over, you know, that was one of the ways the South was punished. Mm. You know, there are many mm. ways uh, that the South was punished for what they did. But one of them was depriving them of the railroads. So as the United States, because we were still an agricultural nation, the United, the, uh, United or Great Britain, England, was the started uh, the Industrial Revolution was there. And it was coming to America, and ultimately we would, you know, in essence, kind of perfect it. But the the railroad was what uh, 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 broadcasted it across the United States, Uh, and that's as we evolved from an agriculturally based nation where more than 97 to 98 percent of our people were involved with producing food, Mm -hmm. to ultimately a culture today where it's the flip-flop that basically less than 2% of our population, 330 million people, are feeding 330 million people. Wow. You know, which allows us to go through the industrial age, and now we are in the 21st century, which is a different age. You could have called it the new age before, but that has different connotations. No, but More appropriately, it would be called the digital age. The digital, Because yes. we're in a, 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 a nation and a world now where digital is the common language of all nations. And that's why the American system still is so relevant to uh, today, because um, being American is not just being a subject that lives within these geographical boundaries right. boundaries, or has one race. It's really this universal idea that the entire globe has taken on, the American system. And so one day I had this experience of looking at the letters of America. It was a hot day, and all of a sudden I looked at the spelling. In America, if you scramble the letters like an anagram, it 
can be respelled as I am race. I am race are the letters of America. And it just kind of makes us less a continent and more the universal right. human. Humanity. I am humanity. I am. I. Oh, wow. That's an interesting perspective. I love that. So then one of the things, I, I want to hear your perspective on this, Joe, and we're almost out of time. But one of the things, my I have a 20-year-old son. I talk about him often because I'm a mom. Uh, and there, it, I, I notice that his age group are are not interested in in politics or voting, or they're disgusted with the politics and therefore don't want to vote. What 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 am I? You know, and I remember kind of going through this when I was twenty something. Well, what's my vote going to really mean? How is that really going to matter? But and, and then the the the. His group of friends sees their, uh, the uh, side of America that has become kind of abusive in the world, and authoritative and, and all of that. And they, and they're, but again, because they're 20-somethings, they don't have the life experience to see the, the broader perspective of what you're describing of that we are in process and we will always be in process of refining our qualities and ideals of democracy. So how, what would you speak to a young adult well, like I, that? Well, uh, it's, it's a common uh, observation that our politics today are more cantankerous and the worst ever with congressional approval below 10% and things like this. That's a false observation, in my opinion. If you study history, you will see that the founders of our nation were more at each other's throats mm. than they are today. And the thing you got to remember, you know, and I could give you countless examples, and there were assassinate, uh, there were duels involved with right. Alexander Hamilton. There were people having affairs. There were people that made stuff up in newspapers that wasn't true. There were people oh, that familiar. said that Thomas Jefferson was having an affair with his uh, slave, Sally Hemings, and that probably was true, uh, although no one can prove it for sure, but it probably was. But it was worse then or as bad as today. But you got to remember is what's unique about America is that in other civilizations— you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the World War One now that right. began with a, an assassination of Ferdinand. And um, we're not shooting each other, uh, politically speaking. We are having political uh, dialogue of opposing viewpoints. And ultimately, the decider is the uh, electorate. And, you know, if you don't like your leaders today, you get a new set tomorrow. So things change, and it was just as bad as in the past as it is today. And it's better than killing each other with guns, uh, even if it is kind of politically yelling at each other, so to say. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your uh, perspective on that, Joe. Uh, so the book is called Visions of America. You can go to visionsofamerica.com, and your email address is on that website, yes? I yes. think I saw it. So yeah, but I'll give you that to you one more time. Joseph, Joseph at visionsofamerica.com. So again, I want to give you a heartfelt uh, thanks and gratitude for the work that you have done throughout your lifetime, and it's going to make me cry. Oh, my gosh. Because this, the, the photos that you've taken and your description in it and all of that is, it is a chronicle of our uh, country's evolution of democracy. And I am deeply grateful. <laughs> well, I'm I deeply grateful to know and to have met you and to see this work because I am going to be passing this down to my grandkids. Well, I will give you a big radio hug and 
uh, know that it's always most fun to talk about photography when you can't see it. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks for joining us. And uh, for everybody else, if you missed anything, once again, go to livingyourinspiredlife.org. And so I'm simply going to say, and so it is, namaste.